Welcome back, one and all, the Dragon Squad. It's a fantastic Monday with me, John Arola, and Francesca Fiorentini making one of her few remaining appearances ever on the show. Francesca, welcome back. <laughs> what? I mean, ever? For a Stop bit. Stop it. You gotta, you gotta make it dramatic. It's gotta have a, a sense of exclusivity. Okay. I want people to tune in. Cool. <laughs> I want to yes. lie. Don't, don't, don't jinx me here. All right. I, yeah. I get to live after this kid is born. <laughs> if yeah, that Unlike would be great. In the house of the dragon, which I am incredibly triggered by. I want everyone to know. <laughs> it is like maximum problematic birthing scenes right Honestly, before you get birth. Like for, for a society so obsessed with succession, you'd think they'd care for moms a little bit more than that. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, they are, they do care about succession, but the mom isn't the most important part of the succession. Let's be clear about they, this from they, their they point are, of view. They're just Republicans in today's mm. day. Like, it's just a yeah. vessel for my <laughs> seed. You know what I mean? Like, ugh. ugh. Anyway, uh, yeah, great episode of House of the Dragon. If you haven't been watching it, you should watch it. It's good. It's Game of Thrones again. It's, it's pretty enjoyable. I'm enjoying every episode. Anyway, um, aside from House of the Dragon, we've got House of the American What Remains of Democracy that we're going to be breaking down through the course of today, including giving you a preview of the return of the January 6th hearings. Yes, they will be coming back. In fact, I'm going to be doing uh, live reactions and commentary this Wednesday. We've got a couple of little mini bombshells we need to break down today on the show, as well as just, I mean, if you know me, if you've been watching the show for some time, you know that what I am looking forward to in terms of entertainment going forward is just DeSantis and Trump just hitting each other. Mm -hmm. We got a little bit of that. It gets real petty, so you know that's going to be fun. We've got the minimizing of political violence. We've got attacks on tattoos. we got a lot to talk about. And if you stick around for the full show, in the aftermath, we will be talking about masculinity. We have the take of a true expert on the topic, mm -hmm. Ben Shapiro. So you know that that's going to be fun. And we've got a fun little throwback that I found in doing my research for that topic. So definitely stay tuned for the aftermath. Uh, in advance of that, if you would mind hitting the like button and sharing the stream, that'd be great so people know we're live. And if you want to send us any comments, tweets, or super chats as we go, we'll respond. But with all that said, Francesca, are you ready to start the show? Yes. Good. So okay, let's make one of these final ever appearances a special event, <laughs> starting with this. Did it hit you at one point that this is way bigger than it appeared in the beginning? Absolutely. You get a real aha moment when you see that the White House switchboard had connected to a rioter's phone while it's happening. That's a big, pretty big aha moment. You get an aha Wait a moment. minute. Someone in the White House was calling one of the rioters while the riot was going on? On January 6th. Absolutely. And you know who both ends of that call? I only know one end of that call. I don't know the White House end which I believe is more important. You know, if the White House, even if it's a short call and it's a connected call, um, who is actually making that phone call? Is there a simple, innocent explanation for that? Was it an accidental call from the White House that just happened to call numbers that somebody misdialed a rider that day on January 6th? Probably not. Well, look, I believe in being fair we can't say definitively that it is impossible that someone accidentally butt dialed a random number and that random number happened to go to one of the people that were in that moment storming the Capitol. That is possible. Equally likely is that it was an intentional thing, I suppose. And so that is a bit of a bombshell coming from former representative Denver Riggleman, who's this like technical aid and advisor of the January 6th uh, committee, who's also apparently writing a book about the hearings, which was news to me, also news apparently to the committee, and they don't seem very happy about it, but he is dropping some bits of information. So he talks about this call, and uh, as he says, we don't yet know what it was about, if it was literally anything, who was involved in it, except that supposedly the New York Daily News believes they know who was called, and that is Anton Lunnick. He'd already been, uh, he's already been charged and investigated for being a part of the January 6th uh, insurrection, uh, declared a knucklehead in the initial reporting on him. But um, if you jump ahead, you can see there is a photo of him. I will say what why the New York Daily News feels they're sure that it's this guy is, that's not well described, and no one else is running with that. So I would say 
as of right now, we don't know who was on either side of the call. But this was the first supposed allegation with evidence of direct communication between uh, the White House and an insurrectionist. That is basically all we have to go on on that right now, Francesca. Is is this just selling books? Does he have good ev- What do you think? No, I think this is huge. Um, I think, you know, there's there's been a lot of like, you know, how involved were the Oath Keepers? How involved were the Proud Boys? You know, who had com- communications with who? What about other like low level, quote unquote, you know, Congress people collaborating with like Ali Alexander or, um, you know, uh, helping w- with buses uh, to the Capitol building, right? Whether it's Charlie Kirk or some other dark money group um, helping bus people to the Capitol. But as the riot starts, having a phone call from an, someone part of that riot to the White House, that's very different. That is like beyond, like you've crossed the Rubicon. You cannot say, I didn't know what was going on. Um, I had no communication with them and I wasn't leading them. And we, of course we've heard testimony from, let's say Cassidy Hutchinson, um, aide to Mark Meadows, who testified that Donald Trump knew and everyone in the White House knew about the violence and essentially did not call off the mob. Um, but this feels like, oh no, maybe they actually just egged him on. So I, I think it's, yeah, it's a bombshell. Yeah, I, there, there's so many more details that need to be filled in. And so I don't wanna get ahead of ourselves, especially knowing that the, the coverage is going to begin again this week. It's possible that within 48 hours, we'll know everything that can be known about this. But it was only nine seconds, which isn't enough to have a conversation. It is enough to you know, declare that Order 66 is being initiated or something. Like, if you were just giving a command, that's possible. The the command could be, get out of there. The command could be, you gotta stop. That that could be it. Also, it's possible, maybe they were just calling him back. He called someone in the White House, and they didn't know who he was, and they were just calling him back, although... They just star 69 it, John. It could just be a star 69. Would they be doing any of this amidst the continuing chaos? Because apparently, based on the timeline, this call happened shortly after the Trump statement was put out. That's what the initial information seems to show. God only knows if that's true. And so maybe this is someone they knew that they were trying to save from being rounded up. So they say, get out. I I honestly don't know. But what's interesting is that this is only one of the two sort of communication bombshells coming out of this weekend. We also have this, Meadows texts reveal direct White House communications with pro-Trump operative behind plans to seize voting machines. And this is with an individual that I at least was not familiar with, Phil Waldron, defined here by CNN as an early proponent of various election-related conspiracy theories. We have no word yet on whether he too has been declared a knucklehead, but we will be tracking that. He texted Meadows back on December 23rd, so two weeks or so uh, before the insurrection, saying that an Arizona judge had dismissed a lawsuit filed by friendly GOP lawmakers in the state. Uh, The suit demanded state election officials hand over voting machines and other election equipment. They were looking for some evidence, any evidence. Can I have an evidence, please, sir? I'd like another evidence of voter fraud or whatever. And in relaying that news, he says that this means that opponents can engage in delay tactics over them getting the information. Um, No information ever came out, but Waldron defined the effort in Arizona as, quote, our lead domino we were counting on to start the cascade to overturn the results of elections that didn't feature fraud. Just to be clear, Meadows responded to those texts saying, pathetic. And that's actually exactly how I would have responded, but it's really all in the delivery. (laughs) I think we would have meant something different. So. That isn't with an insurrectionist. And in fact, the texts come half a month before the insurrection. But again, it's someone in the White House directly involved in the various mishmash of efforts to overturn the results of the election, Francesca. Yeah, I mean, the fact that there's some rando with a direct line to Mark Meadows tells you everything you need to know about this attempt to steal the election in 2020. And we had attorneys general never get that right. <laughs> we had the <laughs> attorneys is generals is is also testifying and the lieutenant attorney generals testifying to the January 6th committee that essentially they were being sent YouTube videos about Italy gate and how 
supposed satellites were flipping votes to Biden from Trump, and they had to watch those, I don't know, hour-long videos, and then legitimately investigate whether or not they were based in reality. Lo and behold, not based in reality, based in an actual basement of, uh, you know, probably a 14-year-old that cooked it up um, while they were really high. But, like, do you understand just, like, this pipeline of crazy to being legitimized? And you see that here, and we've seen it throughout this entire effectively attempt to steal the election. Yeah, it's just, yeah, can you imagine being one of those people that has to sort through all that stuff? They were so desperate. They're looking for literally anything anybody posted on TikTok, like how, you know, CERN is going to open a portal to another dimension and through it will come another version of Trump who is still president. I don't know, but someone in the White House had to watch that. Yes. Anyway, we'll see. Here's These are two more little threads that maybe they'll tug on in the hearings uh, later this week. We will be doing live commentary, so stay tuned for details on that. What can we expect in these January 6th hearings now that they're back? The last time there were a lot of bombshells. It's been some time since then. We've had the whole classified documents thing. What can we expect out of these? Well, We might get a referral for prosecution of the president, although if it does come, they're saying it's going to have to be unanimous. As representatives uh, Adam Schiff and Liz Cheney, they say that they do believe that Trump committed wrongdoing in relation to the riot. No real surprise there, but that it will require a unanimous declaration. Schiff told uh, Jake Tapper, we operate with a high degree of consensus and unanimity. It will be certainly, I think, my recommendation, my feeling that we should make referrals, but we will get to a decision as a committee, and we will all abide by that decision, and I will join our committee members if they feel differently. So he's at least signaling he's open to, they come out of this with no referral, and then we just go on about our lives and wait until the next insurrection or something. But he does say, I do agree that there have been several laws broken, and it is, I think, apparent that there is evidence that Donald Trump was involved in breaking several of those laws. When Congress does find evidence that people have broken the law, it is not always the case that it makes a referral. But in circumstances like these, I think that's the better part of the argument. So, by the way, them making the referral, I don't even know how significant of a move that is, because in theory, the DOJ has also been investigating this independently. Maybe the hearings will come up with some evidence that the DOJ hadn't found, which would be embarrassing. And that combined with the referral could lead to them actually doing something. But I kind of feel like Merrick Garland's going to do what he's going to do, regardless of what Adam Schiff and Liz Cheney think about it. But what do you think? I mean, I think when it comes to the committee committee itself, um, given that the Republicans on it are Kissinger, who decided not to run for re-election, and Liz Cheney, who has decided to um, do what a Cheney has never done, which is take, like, the actual moral right road, um, <laughs> like, that I think the committee will unanimously agree and refer criminal charges. Getting Congress on board is a whole other can of worms And it definitely comes down to the November election um, and what happens and whether we're not whether we are going to see impunity or not, I think depends on whether we keep the House and the Senate or not. Um, But it is so chilling to imagine us just taking stock of everything that happened as we've been doing and then moving on and being like, well, what are you going to do? Let's hope that some of the lawsuits that Tish James is issuing against the family bankrupts them. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Or something with the documents. We'll see. Raymond Deary, come on, do your job. I don't know. Yeah, it's all it's all just hopes. We'll have to see. Um, That's just the referral, though. That's not actually the most interesting part of what's coming. So here are the the whisperings that I have heard of what might be coming uh, starting on Wednesday. So. Uh, the panel may may establish a link between Donald Trump and his inner circle, including longtime ally Roger Stone and his former national security advisor Michael Flynn and their communications with far right extremist groups who stormed the Capitol. So not necessarily demonstrating direct communication between the White House and the groups, but the White House with those intermediaries and the intermediaries with the extremist groups. So we might see some evidence of that text messages, maybe transcripts of calls, that sort of thing. Um, They also might discuss uh, whether Trump fired his defense secretary, Mark Esper, to replace him with someone who would support his plan to seize voting machines or delay the certification of Joe Biden's election victory. 
as well as discussions about imposing martial law after election day. Mm -hmm. That seems important. If they replaced a guy like this, and remember, they were firing people left and right who weren't sufficiently loyal at that point. That seems pretty import, uh, important, certainly goes to intent. You don't replace those people because there was voter fraud. You replace those people because you want them to do something that they feel is unethical or illegal. So you've got that coming. Also, uh, Representative uh, Benny Thompson of Mississippi says, quote, we have substantial footage of what occurred that we haven't used. So there's still more footage. I know some people have been wondering, wasn't there that embedded documentary crew that might have footage from the Trump side of this, which we haven't really seen any of? Uh, that is possible. I haven't seen any specifics about what the footage might include, but but we can expect to see some stuff that hasn't happened yet. And finally, and perhaps spiciest of all, we've been waiting to see what would it be like if they actually spoke on the record live with crazy. What if they had Steve Bannon? What if they had Roger Stone? What if they had Donald Trump? They haven't had any of those things. But they will apparently have Virginia Ginny Thomas, wife of Supreme Court Judge Clarence Thomas. And if you think you know what she'll say or what she won't, buckle up, because she crazy. And she may just lay the whole thing bare, Francesca. It's impossible to say at this point. Oh, I'm so excited. You know, I mean, nothing's going to happen. Like, you know, right? Like, uh, uh, Clarence Thomas will still serve on the Supreme Court until his death. Uh, you know, th th we we won't impeach a Supreme Court justice, even though we should and could over this. But Ginny Thompson will absolutely, um, or uh, Ginny Thomas, Clarence Thomas, Thomas. yeah. T thank you. Uh, she will absolutely expose just how crazy she is, and I love it. I think it. I think it'll be good. Uh, we'll um, see. I, I I can't wait to find out. Um, she like would she actually reveal anything she said to Thomas? I don't know. I don't know if she would. And we know that she was texting a lot of people in the White House. We have those texts already. So I don't know what she'll look. The only thing that makes me excited about it is that. All of them know what they were trying to do. Most of them are at least minimally savvy enough to not reveal the whole plan. But she she's like a straight-up QAnon believer. Yeah. Like, she may think, I will initiate the storm by revealing all. Like, we, we honestly don't know. So, uh, personally, I, mean, I know there's going to be a couple of hours of coverage, Jessica yeah. Burbank, and then I'm going to be taking over. I just pray that she goes crazy on my watch because I want to <laughs> cover that. Yeah, yeah you got to fight Jessica for that. I always hate mm -hmm. when it's like you have to do the handoff and it's getting really good. I mean, yeah. we, we'll probably see a version of like the Kavanaugh defense. Like, you know, like what is a devil's triangle or what is, you know, <sighs> whatever. And he's like, um, it's when you go to church and uh, the Holy Spirit, like whatever the hell he says. Because with Ginny, it'll be like, so what is the Kraken? And she's like, well, um, I have an aquarium in my home <laughs> and uh, there is a small little octopus in there with the fish and then that is the crack in um <laughs> <laughs> release that adorable little sucker yeah i happen to notice that uh donald trump bleated something over the weekend that i thought was a little bit weird he sent out this message 96 percent approval rating in the republican party very high numbers on fighting crime the economy, inflation, foreign relations, Russia, Ukraine should never have happened. Thank you. What? And I looked at that and I thought, wait, what what year is it? Is it before the pandemic? What is going on? No, that was that was bleeded out on September 26th of this year. He gets high numbers on fighting crime. In case, I don't know if any of you just came out of a coma, he is not president, nor has he been president for over a year and a half. He has not been fighting crime. Because he cannot fight crime unless he's got some sort of like like cape and mask situation going on. And he leaves Mar-a-Lago and skulks around Florida. He's not the president. He's not in control of the economy, <laughs> nor is he in control of our foreign relations. And I know what you're thinking. Wait, John, you're missing the fact that, yes, all of that's BS. But there's a deeper level of BS, which is that these aren't real numbers. This didn't come from anywhere. This isn't a poll. And I will grant you that. But I take it as a given that he's making up all of this. He's making up that he can be evaluated on things that he's not president to deal with. But more importantly, why? Why bleat this 
madness out over the weekend. Well, I don't think it's that difficult to figure out why. Because while those numbers are fake, there are real numbers that he clearly saw and is very worried about. And that includes this new poll from ABC News. 47% of Republican and conservative leading uh, independent respondents said that they support Trump as the prospective party nominee next, uh, next cycle, while 46% oppose the idea. So he's one point positive, but that represents a 20% drop in support from 2020. Mm -hmm. So since 2020, when we've had him talking about the big lie and all the craziness, 20 point drop, making him just barely above water. And when real numbers like that are out there, when you feel like, oh my God, am I bleeding in the water? Oh my God, is there a DeSantis shaped shark tasting that blood? Then sure, maybe you're gonna wanna jump out there with some fake numbers about how great of a job you're doing as president. What do you think? Yeah, I'm, I I just love him pulling that out of nowhere. Um, and then taking credit for anything that's going on right now. Like if crime is low, uh, if inflation is under control, like I just, but, but again, this is someone who in, just in recent weeks has gone full Q. So they're probably like, oh, he's secretly controlling everything and anything that Biden does good is actually of at Trump's behest. He's making sure the economy doesn't quite tank. He's making sure, you know, that uh, the Russia-Ukraine war is, you know, going the way it should. They don't actually know which way they want it to go because they love Vladimir Putin, so it's not really clear. Nope. Um, but yes, it is, when I see a 20% drop from 2020, it makes my heart sing just a little bit. Then I know we're gonna look at the matchup with Biden. It looks a little less exciting um, because turns out Democrats, not that excited to vote for Biden, but, um, yep. It is important to see that there's a lot of doubt on Trump. And honestly, look, it was bad enough when you have the big lie. It's bad enough we got the January 6th, I mean, the insurrection, and then the January 6th commission and committee hearings. It's bad enough that we're understanding just what a massive fraud this entire family has been in terms of their taxes. But then you got this self-inflicted wound with the documents that unlike tax evasion and unlike, I don't know, I guess the coup's pretty on the nose, but you know, someone who might think, well, the election was stolen. It's just so simple. You don't take secret classified document documents to your home. Yep. And it's and really that a simple was on him. That's on him. He did that to himself. And so it's like, it's a bridge too far. So I do understand the dip. <laughs> I do too. Uh, now let's briefly mention what you alluded to there which is that despite this drop, and again, this drop is about preference. It isn't necessarily about whether they would still support him if he were the candidate. He's probably doing fine there, but it's about whether he will ever become the candidate. But if he does, bear this in mind, in a hypothetical rematch with Joe Biden, uh, Joe Biden is ahead 48 to 46, but if you limit the results to only registered voters, Trump is up 48 to 46. This is, this is now. By the way, this is now that we're talking about. This is dark Brandon. This is this is this is Biden kind of doing some stuff, sort of. I know it's been a few weeks since he's done anything, but a little bit. It's still so close. So I know, I know with the dark Brandon stuff, you know, we use it ironically. There are actual Biden fans who believe, oh, good, now we don't have to worry about that whole like there could be a challenger thing. No, 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 we should still be very worried about Biden being the candidate. He could well beat Trump again, or he could not. And I would argue the stakes in that are pretty high. So mm -hmm. continue to be worried about that. Now, that said, let's turn to something even more fun. The brewing fight, the brawl, the war between Donald Trump and Ron DeSantis is going to be epic in a way, but it's also gonna be super catty and petty. Mm -hmm. So I wanna <laughs> let you know, what Trump is alleged to have been saying about Ron DeSantis and Governor Chris Christie for some reason, uh, this is according to Maggie Haberman, who is saving all this stuff for a book, of course. Anyway, she detailed a meeting that she had with Trump uh, in the summer in Bedminster. He's still meeting with Maggie Haberman. That's the amazing thing. <laughs> anyway, during the meeting, she spoke with Trump about Christie, one of his 2016 election rivals, to which Trump said, I was compared to him. Why? I didn't know I had a that big of a weight problem. Which, first of all, like, why? 
Why is that your response? Second of all, yeah, you know that you do. Come on. <laughs> Come on. You know that you do. But why? Why? Especially because you know that you do. Why? Why are you bringing that up? It's a glass body situation. You don't throw stones. But um, <laughs> he goes on from Chris Christie. Before I, before I let you weigh in, he, Chris Christie, I guess, is easy for him to attack. He's not going to be running again. But Ron DeSantis might. Haberman wrote that she heard of Trump using similar terms to describe DeSantis. Now, she didn't witness this, but she recalled learning from sources that Trump had called DeSantis fat, a phony, and whiny, while also taking credit for him winning the governor's seat in 2018, which we've heard him say that many times before. Maybe phony, too. I haven't heard him call him whiny or fat. Again, and by the way, I, like we, we, we can get objective on this. I'm not pretending that Ron DeSantis is in amazing shape or whatever, but again... Glass bodies, throwing stones, look into it, Trump. <laughs> Francesca, what do you think? Yeah, you know, uh, Trump clearly has those mirrors that they have in the rehearsal, the HBO show with Nathan Fielder, where it's like he walks by it and he sees just like this amazing chiseled young man staring back at him. He's like, your dad did hug you when you were a kid, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> um, he does not see himself the way we all see him, which is a disgusting mass of fascism. He's a massive, massive. It's a mass. figurative, yeah, disgusting mass. Yeah, like people's weight has nothing to do with whether they'd be good or bad in elected office. Like, and I just want to point that out to Trump. Ron DeSantis is going to beat you or not, having nothing to do with whether he's fat or whatever. And and by the way, it doesn't seem to affect Trump either. So. This is not like, please don't fill the comments with like jokes about Trump's weight or whatever. It's not, it's hardly the most important thing. No, please fill but the comments with that because no, but here's the thing is that their side perpetually participates in body shaming, especially, oh, they love to do it if it's like anyone who is like a young woman, a woman of color, love to do that. They love That's true. anybody, but their side mythically thinks that Donald Trump underneath that like tie that goes to his knees and his little like, you know, and his little meals, you know, his man heels, that he is Rambo straight up. There is like, there's a 12 pack there, you know? And you're like, no, homie, that's not the case. You mm -hmm. don't want to see this man with his shirt off. But they equate that with masculinity, with leadership, with whatever the hell. And we, people who live in reality, understand that no, those things are not linked yeah 100 yeah it's just it's such a weird thing for me it's not about the specific thing that he's attacking him for which is you know disgusting um but it's just it's the inability to see how that's going to be interpreted literally every single person who hears that even a lot of republicans would be like really you're you're saying that it's so weird honestly what desantis should do like if i could provide a bit of uh, advice to desantis is and he would never do this he it's, it's why I think he's gonna get destroyed in 2024, at least as of right now, I could change my mind. I just don't think he can put up a strong defense, which with Trump has to be a strong offense. Is he should just, he should just say, oh, that's interesting. I, I saw what you said about me. Uh, let's uh, let's meet and do a, a shirt off uh, uh, dance off challenge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll both get on stage. We'll both take our shirt off. Let you want to talk about alphas. I'll show you an alpha or whatever. Some stupid Republican toxic masculinity BS like that. He'd never do it, well, but put he should someone, do it. Like, you know, the man show used to do with women, just like have oh them God, jump I on a trampoline. We'll do that and then slow it down. And then we'll we'll all <laughs> have a collective puke. Oh um, I'm curious anyway. about this match. I have a lot of thoughts on this matchup. Um, all I have to say, I know we have to wrap, is it's the vaccine. DeSantis can get Trump on the vaccine because Trump wants credit for actually rolling out the vaccine. And it's the one thing that DeSantis will probably talk about. It's his only angle if he chooses to take it, um, but he also needs that MAGA base. So we yeah. shall see. It, and that is, so I think you are very right. I think that's a great point that you're making. But of all the things to attack Trump on, right? it's like the one thing he was kind of right, like not right in that like, it would never have happened if not for him. That's BS. Literally everyone would have put government money into it. It would have been produced exactly the same, probably faster. But he at least said kind of that you should take it. He backed yep. off because he's a coward and he got booed. Yep. But he kind of told people to take it. And that's the thing that he's going to be beaten yep. on. That is infuriating. Yep. Anyway, uh, by the way, really fast bit of good news. If we could jump ahead to graphic nine. 
Good news from my perspective, at least. I'll leave that to you to decide. Uh, Gavin Newsom says he is definitely not running for president in 2024. So on the Democratic side, supposedly, and and by the way, Gavin Good Newsom, news. if he says something, you can take that to the bank. He would never like go back on that or anything. That's not going to happen. He says, not happening. No, no, not at all. I've said it in French, Italian. I don't know German. I mean, I cannot say it enough, but thank you. It's humbling. It is sweet. It's a nice thing to be asked. I mean it. And I never trust politicians, so I get why you keep asking. Okay, well, we'll see. We'll see. I say clear the path. Let's just have a nice little scrum of awesome progressives. Choose the best progressive. And that's the person who takes on DeSantis scrum or Trump. Scrum of or progressives. I like that. What I want. Scrum of progressives. Let's, uh, let's copyright that. The sad thing is that Gretchen will tie your hands, put a gun to your head, and ask if you're ready to talk. For someone so worried about being kidnapped, Gretchen Whitmer sure is good at taking business hostage and holding it for ransom. So some of you that pay attention to politics a lot on a daily basis probably reacted with shock to that. Others uh, might think, wait a second, the kidnapping, is she saying what I think she's saying? Yes, she very much is. Tudor Dixon, real name, we checked. Gubernatorial nominee for the Republicans going up against Gretchen Whitner, Whitmer, who was, of course, the target of a kidnapping plot where they would have kidnapped her and then who knows what afterward, physical violence, sexual violence, assassination. We don't know what they would have done. Tudor Dixon has now made it a part of her stump speech to mock that, to mock Gretchen Whitmer being scared of being kidnapped. That is a thing she is doing, not behind closed doors, as if that would make it right, in front of cameras, enthusiastically. And I guess we shouldn't be surprised. I guess this is where the Republican Party was always going to go. She's got other variations on this as well. At another campaign event later in the day, she doubled down. She joked that Ms. Whitmer had looked unsure of what was going on as she held President Biden's hand during his recent visit to an auto show in the state, quote, the look on her face was like, oh my gosh, this is happening. I'd rather be kidnapped by the FBI. I don't even know what the FBI part is. I don't think that Tudor does either. But the point is, <laughs> you remember how she was almost kidnapped? They were gonna like haul her away and probably kill her. You remember that thing? Let's do some topical jokes about it, Francesca. So I don't know much about Tudor Dixon, but I know she's the worst. Yeah, she's got kind of a stone cold C word vibe going on where and there's no pizzazz, you know, like uh, it makes me it, it takes someone uh, like Tudor Dixon to make you miss someone like Lauren Boebert or Marjorie Taylor Greene, who at least put a little sass into their horrible lines yeah. celebrating political violence. Um, but no, Tudor Dixon, just someone else wrote that for her. And nope. she spit it out. She got a laugh line and an applause. And then she was like, yes, fembot unleashed. Like she was just, she's a frightening character. And I think it is really striking to, her point is about business, right? That like, that yay business, you know, she's gonna handcuff businesses. And, and I love the right still trying to peddle these lies around business as if all we should do in our lives, that Michiganders, that's what's gonna help them, is if they just bow down to big business that has made hand over fist money in the pandemic. And by the way, has forced more women and mothers out of the workforce because we can't get basic things like paid maternity leave, um, paid family leave, that, oh yeah, 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 let's just, please bow down to business even more. This is a woman who's like, says she's pro-family. And that, of course, and you know she's pro-family because she's anti-choice, which is somehow not dissonant for Republicans, even though 60% yeah. of people who seek abortions are already moms. Anyway, um, so it, it just, it's gonna fail, honestly. I'm going with the woman who survived a, uh, an, a like an attempt on her life. That's pretty badass, I would say. And I don't, I don't think this strategy is getting Dixon anywhere. Yeah, I and mean, look, she's just the latest to take this kidnapping plot and try to imply that it wasn't something serious. But we should take it seriously. We have to take it seriously. Like this is this. How do you normalize political violence? This is how you normalize political violence. 
make it a joke. You you make it routine to question, well, is it really that serious? And and this can come in a lot of different forms. Um, the kidnapping plot, well, you know, was it really serious? Tucker Carlson, like a week ago, calling the uh, the coup, the January 6th committee, uh, January 6th uh, insurrection, a nonviolent election integrity protest. My God. This this is how you, people died. People died at that event. This is how you do it. And like, so I've said it for a while, and thankfully this still hasn't happened. If somebody, God forbid, finally brings their AR-15 to a campaign event and guns down multiple Congress people, if you think, well, then that's gonna be a line, and Fox is gonna be like, oh dear God, what have what have we done? What have we been encouraging? No, no, they will immediately leap to trying to find some way to imply that no, secretly the guy was on the left that did it, or he was Antifa, or and you don't think they're gonna be making memes joking about it, about the slain Congress? That is going to happen, and this is this is one step along that path. A really fast statement from the campaign of Whitmer saying threats of violence, whether to Governor Whitmer or to candidates and elected officials on the other side of the aisle are no laughing matter. And the fact that Tudor Dixon thinks it's a joke shows that she's absolutely unfit to serve in public office, which is totally true. Mm -hmm. um, but this has been a really serious block and I don't wanna be too much of a downer. So uh, I know that Tudor Dixon loves jokes. So I've got a joke for her and let's see if she gets this one. The joke is, her candidacy, because right now she's apparently down like 16 points to Gretchen Whitmer. And I think that's hilarious, honestly. I think that that's way funnier, better punchline than any of her jokes about kidnapping. <laughs> any other thoughts, Francesca? I mean, yeah, she's gonna have her own Fox show very, very soon. Yep. Um, sh she'll be fine. I'm sure she's uh, personally wealthy. Um, life's good for Tudor Dixon. Yeah, Tudor Dixon gives off, uh, I've been wealthy since I was being weaned energy. I don't know for sure, I'm pretty sure. I'd bet all that I have, that's not much in comparison to what she almost certainly has, but I'm yeah. pretty sure. She, she, anyway. calls, she, she called people the help at age, like her first words were like, you're fired, you know what I mean? Not long ago, just earlier this month, Tucker Carlson went on an, I swear to God, nearly 20 minute rant about John Fetterman, attacking him in a lot of different ways. Of course he's going to do that. Tucker Carlson wants Dr. Oz to be elected. Why? I mean, Tucker Carlson's a different sort of Republican, right? He thinks differently than others. No, no, Dr. Oz is the Republican. He's gonna support him. The fact that Dr. Oz has no qualification whatsoever He's just a con man who sold people weird mountain berry juice for 30 years or whatever, means nothing. Dr. Oz will vote to cut taxes and so Tucker Carlson will support him. That's it, that's all it takes. But one of the things that he decided to attack Fetterman on were his tattoos, saying all your stupid little fake tattoos, it's a costume of course, duh, it's not real. That is moronic and he, of course is going to be shown to be wrong there, but he is confident that his fans will never find out about that. But we do need to set the record straight, and he did set the record straight, John Fetterman. He explained the meaning behind his tattoos in an op-ed. He says, initially, I get that etching art permanently onto your body isn't how most politicians would express their connection to their communities, partially because for most politicians, they have no connection to their communities. But he goes on to explain his tattoos, saying I have nine dates tattooed on my right forearm, each one is a day on which someone died violently in Braddock, Pennsylvania while I was mayor. Gun violence and violent crime might be jokes to someone like Carlson, but they are very real to people in towns like Braddock. The first one that I tattooed on my arm is 11606. That's the date on which Christopher Williams was shot dead while delivering pizzas. This was a man about my age at the time. He had a 12 year old daughter. I just couldn't get over the fact that he was never going home to her. Another tattoo reads 2307, the date that 23 month old Naya Page was found dead after her father sexually assaulted her and left her in the bitter cold. Her tiny footprints in the snow led an officer to the body. And I have 91613, the date Darrell Royalton, a father of two, was found dead in the yard next to his mother's home after being shot three times. That's why I have these tattoos. They're not some costume. They're reminders of the people we have lost and what I am fighting for. Both the dates on my right arm and the 15104 on my left, Braddock zip code, are personal to me. Ooh. They're not gonna see it, 
Francesca, but if they were, that is just devastating. Have the balls to have this man on. Have him on your show, Tucker. And then if he stumbles, you can make fun of him for having survived a stroke. My guess is actually he'll get a lot of your viewers on his side. He can explain his tattoos to your audience. But that gives me chills. This is someone who didn't do that for a political stunt. This is someone who didn't know that he was going to run for Senate. Right? He had no idea. He was just trying to be a good leader, and he was trying to remind himself of who he fights for. Tucker Carlson is someone who is not responsible to anyone, to any constituency. He doesn't care of the lives that he puts in danger, doesn't care of the people that he's inspired to commit mass murder. The only tattoos that Tucker Carlson condones are the ones that are Nazi symbols, the ones on the mass shooters who've been inspired by his rants about the Great Replacement Theory. But no, someone who actually has tattoos that are meaningful, that are defending the innocent, the young, the victims of crime, no, doesn't care about those. And yet he goes on and on and on and on and on about, about criminals, goes on and on, oh, uh, Fetterman smokes weed. Oh, that means he's going to be light on, on criminals. No, mm -hmm. no. So I just, I love this setup. I can't believe he just allowed this to happen and let Fetterman walk in and be like, no, 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 let me really explain what I'm about. Yeah, it's just, it's, again, Tucker doesn't care, I guess, because all of it, like he's talking about Fetterman wearing a costume. All of this is a costume. All of this is cosplay. All of this is theater. Tucker Carlson doesn't care about any of this. Tucker Carlson cares about the number in his bank account and the bank accounts of other incredibly wealthy people like him. All of this supposed populism is a costume that he puts on like he puts on his flannel or fleece or whatever when he does a the occasional shoot where they march him in front of like a wood paneled wall and pretend that that's the life he lives or whatever. That's all that this is. The idea that a politician could actually care is not only impossible for Tucker Carlson to understand because he is so far from actually caring about any of this, let alone the stakes of it, but he also actively does not want you to believe it. He knows what his fans believe about politics. They have been trained by people like him to believe the government can never do anything for you. It will never do anything for you. The only thing you should hope for in politics is that the people we tell you to hate and fear will suffer. We'll give you that. We'll own the libs or whatever. And someone who actually cares about this, that wants to improve the, the, the lives of their constituents, that is so fundamentally opposed to how they approach governance. Now, hopefully people will get that message. It seems... Okay, at this point, if you look at the most recent polling, Fetterman is up uh, two to five points in a series of polls over the past month, but it is still going to come down to election day. And so we're going to see who has the last laugh on this one. Okay. By the way, they're remaking Roadhouse with Jake Gyllenhaal. Hmm, I don't know about that choice. Of all of the people, first of all, there is a correct answer to who could potentially pull off the Swayze role in Roadhouse. I will leave it to the audience and see if anyone guesses correctly. I'll, I'll reveal my pick in the aftermath. There is okay. one correct answer. You'd have to wait a few years, but there's one correct answer. Anyway, I feel with like that you're not said, legal yet. That's that makes me creeped out. That's not what I mean. <laughs> You gotta wait a few years to see this, but but once you do, <laughs> find out which of the kids from Stranger Things it is after this. <laughs> no, it's the legal person. Okay. Jesus. Anyway, oh, there's some, there's some good guesses actually in the chat. Well, I'm gonna save some of those, but anyway, we need to get to news, which we're gonna do now. Let's start with this. You're seeing here is footage outside of a recruitment center in Russia, which of course would be involved in doing the mobilization that Putin has ordered. And that is a person throwing apparently a Molotov cocktail at it. And that is not the only incident happening at these recruitment centers. So if you've been wondering, how is the draft going? Not great, actually. A Russian man shot the head of a local uh, military draft committee in Siberia on Monday. Uh, he was called up to fight in the war in Ukraine, shot the official. Video shows two military officials on stage in front of a group of new recruits has been called up to fight in the war. Suddenly a gunshot rings out. We're, of course, not showing this. And one of the officials collapses as everyone else runs out of the enlistment in panic. 
Nobody is going to go anywhere, the man shouted moments before opening fire, citing eyewitnesses. The official was apparently Alexander Vladimirovich uh, Elisiv, military commandant who runs the local draft board in the Irkutsk region. He's apparently in intensive care and in an extremely serious condition. The shooter has been taken into custody, reportedly was upset that his close friend had received a draft summons despite a lack of military experience. And so, as we talked about last week, they said it's just going to be people who've previously served. That is not how it has actually gone down. Now, most have not responded by attempting to assassinate draft board officials, but you have a Molotov cocktail. You have the shooting. You have a man ramming, ramming his car into the entrance of a different recruiting center in a southern town. I mean, look, it's just multiple instances of violence. Um, I'm sure there are people who are thrilled to go, excited to likely die in a needless war in Ukraine. I don't know. Um, but some of them are not happy about it. They don't like how this is escalated. They don't feel like there's any point in them going and dying. And uh, the violence, of course, is unacceptable. You can't attempt to assassinate officials, Francesca. But the people are fighting back and apparently one of the only ways they know how. Absolutely. I mean, it's just an insight into what general Russian society, despite the amount of censorship uh, on the news and on the Internet and what they're being told and how it's not actually a war. It's like, no, 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 they know because everyone probably knows someone who's died at this point. Uh, there's been a massive Russian casualties. And uh, no matter how it's being spun, the reality on the ground is that it's not going well. And they certainly don't want to be cannon fodder for Putin's vanity war slash not war. So it makes sense. And this is, you know, tale as old as time. I mean, there were attacks on recruitment centers, um, not attacks, but like, you know, resistance to recruitment during the U.S. Vietnam War um, by like incredible war resistors. So it's going to happen. And sadly, also, apparently this draft is disproportionately targeting people who are of ethnic minorities, um, who are actually in the regions that once were Ukrainian, who are now being told to go fight more Ukrainians. Um, so it is not falling evenly on the Russian people uh, in and of itself, but yeah. Yeah, 100%. Um, more details just to give you a sense of the vibe in Russia. Vladimir Putin, allegedly, according to an independent uh, journalist, announced the limited mobilization for the special military operation, the draft for the war, uh, in regular uh, people speak, and then immediately escaped to his secret palatial complex near Lake Valdai, halfway between Moscow and St. Petersburg. So he went to his fancy house in the woods, basically. He's apparently been resting his, quote, body and soul. Oh, God. You know, put that. At the luxury complex, which is situated within a forest, uh, it boasts a three-story spa building complete with a float pool and mud bath and a personal beauty parlor. Oh, he's doing a little bit of work on himself. What do you know? Well, do you, where boo? Where he sleeps. Exactly. <laughs> and um, I rest my soul. Like, that is <laughs> that was the vibe. Jurassic Park theme at first. <laughs> no. No, no, no. Okay, anyway. Um, yeah, uh, you can see some uh, photos of it. It's super fancy, because remember what all of this is about. All of this is making him and keeping him possibly, allegedly, the wealthiest person on the planet. So that's nice for Vladimir Putin. Anyway, with that said, that is unfortunately all the time that we have for our first hour. It's also a school shooting, by the way, in Russia, which you don't often hear about, but it has yeah. happened. We'll have more details um, a little bit later on. For now, though, thank you if you've been listening on the linear platforms or on our podcast. But if you're on Twitch or YouTube or one of the other platforms, we've got way more to get to in the aftermath with Francesca Fiorentini. So don't go on away. In a couple of minutes, we'll be back. Suspicious Pergola says, John, the chat is on fire and your big, strong, muscly arms only have time to save one of the dragons. Who do you save? No cowardly answers. Well, the principle that I have always abided by is the one that we're taught on planes when it comes to our oxygen masks. First, you have to save yourself before you can save anyone else. So I will be saving me. That's not what you were expecting, was My it? My big, strong, muscly um, arms will be holding myself. <laughs> That's such a Trumpian <laughs> thing. I think the one who should be saved is me. Me. Most important. I think you would all agree <laughs> you should burn and I should live. <laughs>
Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.